This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 306, Karen Hand on Demystifying Hypnosis. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. Happy New Year and welcome back to Work Smart Hypnosis, where very often I'm here teaching you specific methods you can use with your clients as a hypnotist or hypnotherapist, as well as getting into the business of hypnosis, talking about the skills that are necessary, because what good are our methods as hypnotists unless there's actually a person in front of us making use of that professional service, and very often to bringing on outstanding guests to really capture the dialogue about what's their unique experience. Experience in terms of how they got into this industry, how they approach the work in terms of their clients, and also what's working for them in terms of bringing in their business. Very often, it's about bringing in new voices and new points of view, though also at the same time, it's bringing back onto the program some of my favorite people. In fact, this week, episode number 306, I'll call it out once again, Karen Hand is my favorite hypnotist. This is Karen's third time on the program, and this week we're going to talk about demystifying hypnosis, which really cool at the beginning of this, we began with a different understanding as to exactly what that meant, and you're going to hear both sides about how do we better explain to the client what is hypnosis and how it works. Also, for us as the practitioner to embrace the understanding as to exactly what it means to step into that role as the hypnotist in terms of how we serve our client, how we can stop to change the dialogue around marketing and sales to instead shift it over to the two premises that work every single time in terms of marketing and promotion by simply reframing and better understanding exactly what our role is in terms of informing the public. We talk about a whole bunch of resources inside of this session, so it's going to be helpful to head over to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash the number 306. That's going to bring you over to the show notes as we talk about previous appearances, Karen's outstanding book, her website, and I'll give a quick plug here for a masterclass training that Karen and I actually did together, I believe back in either April or May of 2020, all about scriptless hypnosis, which even if you're a person who never learned to hold a script and read to a client, this understanding of scriptless hypnosis is the mindset of truly listening to our client and feeding back through the mechanisms of some very specific techniques, how we can use their own words to produce outstanding change. This on-demand workshop is still available. If you head over to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no scripts, plug in those two words after that. Again, we'll link to it in the show notes of this episode. That's how you can get instant on-demand access to this presentation. We did that as a live real-time webinar back in 2020, and it's still available now on demand. And I'll tell you, people still pick it up on a monthly basis, and I get outstanding feedback as I jokingly pat myself on the back and the techniques that I taught, as well as the techniques that Karen taught. And just to practice what I preach, some of the methods that she shared in that presentation, I'm now using with my clients as well. So check that out, worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no scripts. Here's what you're about to learn inside of demystifying hypnosis. How do we better explain hypnosis to our clients? How do we better understand what the process is and how it works for ourselves as practitioners? And how do we inspire this new crop of people who are being certified and learning in our skills? And as I say, the more we're all successful, the more we're all successful, helping to change the dialogue to better spread the awareness about what we do and how we help people. So with that, let's jump directly into this outstanding episode to kick off the new year. Here we go, episode number 306, Karen Hand on demystifying hypnosis. So I've been saying this for a couple of years that Karen Hand is my favorite hypnotist. So as we're kicking off 2021 with the first episode of the new year, welcome back to the program, Karen Hand. (laughs) Thank you so much, Jason. And I hope your opinion doesn't change because what we talk about today might upset a lot of hypnotists. Oh, fun. 
<laughs> well, I'd share. There's a, there's a Facebook group that popped up, and the dialogue was someone going, I don't feel comfortable putting testimonials on my website. It feels like I'm bragging, to which I went, I can understand your opinion. However, right. I think the opinion of your client is more important, and they want to see that stuff. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so with, with it, because I know you and I both have some strongly held opinions about this concept we're about to talk about of demystifying hypnosis, uh, which let me just mention two quick resources here, uh, because you're here for the third time on the program. Previous episodes, number 79, Karen Hand on Hypnotic Secret Sauce, as well as episode 171, we brought you on two years ago for the 4th of July. Karen Hand on Hypnotic Freedom. Head over <laughs> to the show notes of this episode, which are just simply defined at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 306. I'm sure knowing you and me, we're going to mention a bunch of cool stuff, and that's where you can find everything that we're about. That's right. Good. About. So before we jump in, for those that you're new to, could you briefly introduce yourself? Yes, I am Karen Hand. I'm a board certified hypnotist. I have an office in Chicago, but I practice globally because I do my entire business primarily on Zoom. So I'm available every place. Nice. And any specific specialties, any specific things you tend to work on more than anything else? I've tried several specialties, Jason, and I know what you say about niching. And yes, I niched but I get bored. So I have remained a generalist because I, if I did smokers all day, every day, it would drive me nuts. I like the variety. So I, I remain a generalist. Because Karen Hand is her own brand. Well, I Boom. believe that to be true. <laughs> yes. No, and I'd share, you know, just to elaborate on that for a moment, I do talk about the ability to niche down. Though if you look at my website, which is a little similar to yours in terms of the context of it, I the first page is all about me, all about hypnosis. Ooh, we we're going to talk about that today. As well as then the opportunity to look at very laser-focused individual pages Yes, about the separate services, which the beauty of this is the website itself is a bit general. It does predominantly feature two main services. For me, it's Stop Smoking and then Business Confidence. Then there's a drop down with other services, and that's where you'd find almost everything else. The beauty of this is, is that if we're now advertising or marketing, we can bring them to something very specific. And as soon as someone finds us, though, they have the opportunity to reach out and go, hey, I saw this. Can you help me with that other thing? And then you have the option of either yes, or I can go, that sounds weird, and you sound like a problem client. Please go <laughs> to Aaronhand.com and just okay. Thanks a lot. I do get a lot of problem clients. And actually, Jason, I like problem clients, so you just keep sending your problem clients to me. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. So the topic that we, we chatted about, and this turned into, hey, we need to record this, and here we go, was right. this idea of demystifying hypnosis which those were your words, and that's why it became the podcast episode title, so you made my job easier. Though, when you say demystify hypnosis, can you kind of break down what you mean by that? I certainly can. What I mean by it, and on the cover, the front page of my website, right there up front, the first thing I tell somebody who finds me online is hypnosis is not magic, hypnosis is not voodoo, hypnosis is you do. And that may scare some people off. They might look at that and go, well, I don't want to do it. I want somebody to do it for me. Good. Go see Jason Lynette. Let him do it for you. <laughs> Are we going to do this I'm the whole not episode? Gonna do it for <laughs> Touché. So I'm not going to do it for you, and I want you to know that right up front. Now, that brings in a lot of calls. What do you mean? What I mean is what we do, and this is, this is the little side note for hypnotists, we're not all that special. You know, and I, I, like most hypnotists, when I first learned this modality, oh my gosh, I had the secret in my hand. I knew how to help everybody. And I was so excited. It was just such a wondrous thing. I could just help change people. And one of the early things that I did, which was a real learning curve for me, was I had my new business cards and I would see people smoking out on the street. Now, this was way back in 2005. And people would... I would see groups of people clustered together smoking, and I'd walk up to them with a big smile on my face and hand them a business card and say, I'm a hypnotist, and I know how to help you quit that. Oh, I'm sure that went Come well. Come see me. What? I'm sure that went well. <laughs> 
well, the first time I was just taken aback when they were so upset about it and didn't like it. And I saw them throwing my business card in the garbage. Second time, it took me twice. Second time, I didn't get a good response either. And I went, oh, bing, 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 bing. I can't make anybody want to do anything. So I went home. I beefed up my website and gave them options. So when they were in a different trance, they, you see when I went up to them, they were in a smoking trance. But when they were in a different trance, the I need to stop smoking trance, I wanted to have everything there for them easy to find. And that's what I mean by demystifying. We can't make somebody do something they don't wanna do. People do things they don't want to do, and when we listen carefully, we can find leverage to help them make a change, but if they absolutely, at their core, don't want to make a change, we can't make them do it. Which right there is exactly where we have to spend some time and talk about vampires. <laughs> okay, go. Because I, I love a good transition, that's logical. No, it, th this is a, I, I actually just Googled this, I'll tell you what I Googled and what came up. I typed in, why can't Dracula enter without invitation? <laughs> this ah. is going to go somewhere healing, so stick with me for a okay. moment. So the principle is that in a lot of the older movies, and of course I'm going to the ultimate in vampire literature, Leslie Nielsen and Mel Brooks's Dracula Dead and Loving It. Of course, yes. Classic, yes. <laughs> Where there's a whole principle to these stories, though, as to why they cannot enter a space if they're not invited. And I know this is the obvious healing metaphor we should be going after. Well, according to this source, it depends on what vampire literature you're reading, of which I think I've read um, the original Dracula book, and then that was it. So clearly, I'm an <laughs> expert. But this somehow became a metaphor for me that kind of goes to what you're talking about, that I tend to lead a much more successful business, a much more comfortable lifestyle, because here's how, I only work with those people who invite me in. Yes. Not to say I'm, I'm now realizing I'm the vampire of the story and that's probably, <laughs> that's we'll okay. edit this out in post to quote Chris and Mike here. But where <laughs> to look at how I'm looking to work with those people, as you told the story, to not walk up to those people and say, hey, I can help you. But instead, this is the value of, you know, now clearly I put out a lot of invitations for people to come into the world of what I do. the way that That's way different, right? Yes. So it's by putting that information out there, this is, as you say, demystifying the process, educating them, and in some ways, back to that testimonial reference from the Facebook group, I had to respond that, realize that the ultimate benefit of your marketing is to attract in the people who are looking for what you provide and you can help, as well as, let's throw in a modifier word here, appropriately propel away the people who are not a fit for what you do. Absolutely. So I have some colorful testimonials that are on my website, which draw in more people like those folks that I've loved working with. As well, they probably push away the people that you know, are not going to be as ready to jump into something as the ones that I'd want. So right. again, in the back of your mind, just think back to vampires and somehow there's actually a good positive message inside of there. Well, when <laughs> someone doesn't want to come in, when they don't want to come to the table, they're not likely to enjoy anything that's there if you make them sit at the table, right? Are you trying so, to, to one-up my metaphor? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. As a matter of fact, as I was saying that, I immediately <laughs> saw your aversion table and I thought, well, wait a minute, nobody wants anything on the aversion table anyway. Yeah. But <laughs> so it took me to a whole different place. If we're going to deal with all these metaphors, right? You got to wait until they're ready. And our job as hypnotists, if we're smart hypnotists or salespeople, as the case may be, our job is to lay it all out there so that they can find us when they're ready. McDonald's doesn't make anybody walk in the door or, or go through the drive-thru. They don't make anybody. What they do is they advertise, oh, you'll be so happy. You'll be with your family. It'll be such a good time. It's uplifting. It's happy. It's fun. It feels so good. And so if you're in a mood, 
and you want to feel good, that comes to mind. And it's so easy to just pull yourself through the McDonald's and buy some of that nasty offering. <laughs> My personal opinion. Sorry, I didn't mean to taint it. Taint allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Yeah, but, which, I mean, looking at that example, too, of this, this is where I was on a call with someone this morning who is actually not a hypnotist and looking at the, the business consulting that I offer. And there suddenly came this turning point where he said, yeah, but I'm really not good at advertising. I'm really not good at marketing. To which I was able to jump in and say, well, hang on a second. First of all, to use the appropriate language, if you keep saying that garbage to yourself, that's always going to be true. However, this is actually a person that I'd met in person a bunch of times. We went back to an old networking group that I was a member of a bunch of years ago. And at that point in that group, this person would get up on a weekly basis and BNI, they have someone who's the educational coordinator and get up and present, get up and teach. And what I had to update that thinking of to demystify sales. Oh, do you see how we made that? Yeah. Transition, how about it? Yeah. Was all about instead, if you're always educating and informing by looking at it from those filters now in terms of bringing people into our world, the process now begins to quite practically write itself. Yes. And the benefit is, again, we're drawing in those people that are a fit as well as propelling away the ones that may not be a fit. So from that mindset of educating and informing, so, so from that then, what did you start to do differently other than accost smokers on the street? <laughs> okay, so I stopped telling people, and, and, and quite frankly, I believe we're in the belief change business. Mm -hmm. I stopped believing that I could change somebody. I stopped believing that I had the magic. I stopped believing that, oh, I've got, oh, I've got the magic pill. I'm the wizard. And I started realizing that I am the facilitator. My job is to listen carefully to the way they're thinking or believing about something. And if they want to make a change there, then we find out what we can change, what little change we can make that will make a difference, that will change the belief and have them believing that they can do something that they formerly thought they couldn't. So there's a quote that comes to mind, and I always have to tell the lineage of it because I heard Michael Elner say, all the way back to, I think, 2010 or 11, I heard him say, learn from people who disagree with each other. Yeah. And right there was why this entire podcast series launched. That was the inspiration for now we're 300 plus episodes in. I also have to give credit to the fact that apparently he was actually quoting Scott Sandland. So really, it's his quote. So this is where I'm going to agree with you, but also disagree with you for a bit. Okay. And this was something that I realized we did uh, back in either April or May in 2020. You and I did a online workshop all about scriptless hypnosis. Absolutely. You taught some techniques. I taught some techniques. And in about four hours time, and I'm getting so much feedback from what you taught, not what I taught, but so, <laughs> so much feedback. No, the, my people were already in it. Of these strategies to, again, put away the scripts. And anybody who's curious, it's a really affordable program. Just head over to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no scripts. We got that set up and that's where you can see exactly what that is. And it's instant on demand. It's a class we did last year, but it works as the replay access. So I've heard you say, I don't have to be the wizard. I, I'm going to agree with you here, but there's a bit of a modification that I've brought to that. And here's the story behind it. It's to, again, back to my reference to the testimonial objection, where it's less and less about this person's opinion, it's really about the opinion of the client. So I use, for example, a fair amount of hypnotic phenomenon in my work. And some mm -hmm. practitioners go, that's a stage hypnosis trick. That doesn't fit in hypnotherapy, to which I go, I can agree with you. However, if my client leaves the process going, well, I felt relaxed, I don't know if something happened, part of it begins to unravel. So that's why right. I put a big focus on hypnotic phenomenon. Though it's not the main focus of doing hypnostunts, these individual methods serve a purpose in terms of the metaphor of change. So, I'm right there with you. Yeah, so I'm laying the foundation here before I attack. So <laughs> the principle becomes, let me go out of my expectation for a moment and go into the expectation of the client. Because let's harness the belief system that they might have that 
they've seen a stage hypnosis show where from the outside perspective, the hypnotist is giving instructions and people are now compelled to do those things. They've seen some things in movies and there's some bits in movies that are very positive around mm -hmm. hypnosis. I think there's a movie called Trance, which at least the first two thirds, I'm on board. Then it goes somewhere else. Other than that, okay. really good. Um, and there's, there's these representations that, you know, you and I probably, I know I did. You might've had too. I had calls coming in. Yeah, I saw that movie Get Out. Absolutely. I know it's not exactly that, but can you really help me quit smoking? And <laughs> let's give people credit. They were able to make the modifications to go, clearly we're not, I don't want to spoil the rest of the movie. Go, go see it. It's really good. Yeah, go see the movie. It's brilliant. Well, I yeah, thought it was so, brilliant. There were plenty so of people who didn't. Yeah, yeah so what I'm getting at here is our client has the expectation that we are the person who can get them to do things they normally wouldn't do, which think about this for a moment. Normally, they wouldn't stand up in front of an audience and speak and feel confident. Yes. Normally, they wouldn't throw out the cigarettes. And, and yes, I'm kind of bending these paraphrases and directions. Now, I'm never overtly saying to my client, I can make you do this. But then again, I'm never bringing it up. Now, now let me, now let me step in, Jason, and, and clarify one thing. Yes. Mostly what I want to demystify hypnosis for is for hypnotists. Yeah. I want hypnotists to understand they're not the answer man. They are not the wizard. The, the wizardry, the magic is all in your client. Now, you can look like a magician. You can look like a wizard if you're successful in pulling out the success strategies from your client. But you don't have them to give to them necessarily. So, so in exactly what you said in a slightly reversed manner, I had a client who called me and said, a prospective client who called and said, I saw a stage show last night. Can you do this? And I said, absolutely come on in. And because I listened and paid attention to what he was telling me, he told me he believed in phenomena and he believed the change could be instant. So we went with that belief, Nice. but it wasn't my belief. It was his belief. So when he came into my office, absolutely. I stuck his hands together. I stuck his hand to his, to his chair. He couldn't get out of a chair. We had all sorts of phenomenon that we played with. I knew that he had to experience some of the phenomenon to go ahead and believe in the change. So what I expect, I love that, of my, my catchphrase of that is that sometimes you actually have to listen to your client. <laughs> which shouldn't, shouldn't be, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't be a profound statement, but I, I hear this and this is a, bit of a respectful rant that I go off when I do my trainings about how I do something a little revolutionary in my office working with clients. And again, I'm like you, everything's now online, where I get a call from a client and we decide to work together and they have an issue they want to resolve. And here's the profound thing that I do. I work with them on the issue they wish to resolve. How about it? Wow. Which I say this because well, let's go there. I see a lot of pseudo psychiatric analyzation that's going on where they're going, oh, that's because of this. That's because of that. And in the words of Roy Hunter, session one, positive trance trip. Let's directly go after the work and let's bring Richard Nongard into this conversation where he talks about how so much of the research around hypnosis, the clinical data around the methods that we use is around a direct model of hypnosis. You want to quit smoking. I hypnotize you. I talk about no longer needing those things. I talk about moving on from those things. Whatever your story was before, even without having to know it, can become every reason why you don't have to do that anymore. So I begin. I had a client years ago. Somehow I'm flashing back to, I think we, we had this discussion when we did the no scripts thing. He calls up, a student of mine, he had taken some workshops of mine, he'd done training elsewhere. And he goes, I'm working with this person that she's got a sugar addiction and we're like four sessions in and nothing's budging. What do you think I'm doing wrong? And I'm like, well, you have to tell me what you're doing first. <laughs> and he goes, well, we're dealing with this event involving her father. There was no abuse or anything too traumatic, but there was something that he did and she can't forgive her father. She refuses to forgive him and we're stuck on that. I'm like, well, what about the sugar thing? It's like, what do you mean? I'm like, she hired you to work with the sugar issue. 
have you addressed that? No, I was trained that I have to deal with all the emotional stuff first. I'm like, hypnotize her, produce some phenomenon, told her she's, tell her she's now drawn to other things in the appropriate quantities. Problem resolved. There you go. So we, again, go after the issue first. Uh, let, me, let me kind of spin this another direction, though, because I'll tell you the direction I thought this was going to go when we decided to talk about demystifying hypnosis. Okay. And it's whether or not we use that H word to describe <laughs> what we do. Well, I think that that's, that is definitely personal preference. And I have had students who practice in a very um, rural, religious area, and they can't get anybody to to overcome their negative beliefs about hypnosis. In that event, it might be better to call it mindfulness. I don't know. In that event, it might be better to call it, um, uh, use your brain for a change to steal a title. Um, <laughs> but you call it anything you want to. I don't care if you call it mindfulness. I don't care if you call it um, guided visualization. It's all hypnosis. It's all the same thing. But when I want to talk about demystifying hypnosis is taking the pressure off of hypnotists to have to have all of the answers because the answers are in their client. Which, by the way, this is a hobby of mine. I did look. Brainwashingwithkarenhand.com is available. And uh, we'll... <laughs> No, I kind of no. like it. I, I may go run by that. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can have it. I'll let this one sit. I won't squat on this one. No, I bring that up because this is, to, to give the history lesson here, remember that Dave Elman, uh, people knocked on his stage door and it was two doctors going, teach us medical hypnosis. And Dave Elman responds, I don't know what that is. He was an entertainer. He was a vaudeville stage hypnotist. But they said, we had learned a model of hypnosis based in really long techniques and a lot of uh, creative metaphors. And as early as the 1940s and 50s, the origins of what's now the modern HMO system, you've got eight minutes in the room with the patient, make it count. So they had watched Mr., not Dr., but Mr. Elman, deeply hypnotize 20 participants in 90 seconds. And they're going, this is the hypnosis we need to learn, which... To round out the history lesson, that's where it began the uh, sort of legacy of the non-medical hypnotist, where the layperson was teaching the medical staff how to do their jobs in a slightly better way. And that's the legacy of Dave Elman. So even Elman, now knowing that was the 1940s and 50s and such, was saying, people are often concerned about the word hypnosis. I've listened to the recordings enough, and I, even I don't know. <laughs> channeling my impression of Larry Elman or doing I was just going to say, you sound a lot like Larry. It, it's somewhere in the middle. I go back and forth depending <laughs> on the day. Uh, so call it medical hypnosis. I'm going to teach you how to medically relax is what Dave taught. Now, bringing that to the current era, I'm aware as somebody who's trained and certified a bunch of people that it's exactly what you said. It's also about the dialogue with the client. So here is the lacrosse coach who is uh, coming into a school a uh, private Catholic school, and is now using these techniques. And as she calls it, I'm going to teach you a method of sports refocusing. Came yes. Sort of a branding around it. Here's someone I had as a student who's in a market that I want to get into because he's <laughs> working with day traders. And he ah. teaches it around neurological restructuring, which then he's doing hypnotic techniques, which is that dishonest? I've sometimes had a person uh, ask, to which I go, shut up, I'm teaching. No, which I respond, <laughs> well, no, because this is a dialogue of Richard Nongards, where he talks about mindfulness as a technique. There's history of it going back thousands right. of years. So most of these methods, as hypnotists, we are expert modelers. We are taking visualization, uh, future pace yourself into the outcome. These are things that have been around forever. We're just now doing them with hypnosis. So we can present it as anything else that we want. I, I think the bigger concern is that of recognizing, and this is coming from someone with um, Virginia Hypnosis, Work Smart mm -hmm. Hypnosis. <laughs> the new project did not take off until I swapped. It was going to be a, a podcast called Business Influence Systems, selling into a product called Hypnotic Language Hacks. And the thing that really made that take off was swapping it. The entry point is Hypnotic Language Hacks, the new podcast, bringing people into a program called Business Influence Systems, which <laughs> here's why. I'm a unicorn, Karen. <laughs> no, it's where to, to get the foot in the door in that world, I had to lead with the H word. 
absolutely. Because, I get it. Well, just to say it politely, Google me, it's all you find. So I have right. to call it out before people come in. So there's always that right in terms of how we represent it. But I love what you said, though, about demystifying it even for the practitioner, because it's where our internal story that we represent, whether we say it or whether we convey it, translates over to the client experience. Yes. And, and my three point program for that is know yourself, know your outcome, and know your audience. Those are the three things you've got to know up front. The reason I say you've got to know yourself first is because if you don't ever want to do any kind of thing like, like uh, magnetic fingers, if you don't believe in that, if you think that's schlocky um, stage show stuff and you don't ever want to use it, then by all means, build yourself strictly as a medical hypnotist or a mindfulness coach or something else, right? If you, and, and do what you're comfortable with. You've got to do what, you've got to know what you are comfortable with. When people call me and ask me if I will do um, past life regressions with them as an example. Now, quite frankly, I love regression and people spontaneously regress to past lives periodically. But I don't really want to spend the time doing per se past life regression. So if somebody calls me up and asks me if I do that, yes, I do it. But let me refer you to this other person because it's not something that I want to spend my time necessarily doing. Mm -hmm. But you got to know yourself for that. Know what you can do and don't do anything that you can't deliver on. You got to make sure that whatever you call yourself or bill yourself or say that you can do, that you actually can do it. When the client called me and said he saw it on a stage show, can I do that? I could congruently, legitimately say, yes, I can, because even though I don't ever intend to do stage shows, I took a stage show class. So I would know what they do. And I use some of their magic, I say with air quotes, I use some of their magic in my office because it makes sense. It works. I happen to bill myself as a hypnotist, not a hypnotherapist, not a mindfulness coach, not a hypno coach. I bill myself as a hypnotist because I like the allure that goes, the mystical allure that goes along with that, that the client brings into them. I mean, when they choose me for that, right? That but if they, me, don't want to, oh yeah. if they don't want to do hypnosis, they won't call me. And that saves me a boatload of time. Nice. Yeah, there you years ago. You select yourself out. I don't think I've ever told the story on the podcast, though I always have to inoculate the entry point into it because we're a culture now that the moment I mention anything political, uh, one part of the audience goes, I'm out. Yep. Um, <laughs> yes. Which let me talk about a very specific moment in American history that those in the US may remember anyone else. Stick with me, I'll do my best to describe it. Which, whether you were a fan of John McCain or not, who was running against Barack Obama in 2008 for Obama's first term, mm -hmm. whether you liked McCain, whether you liked Obama, it really doesn't matter for the story. Because there was a moment, uh, John McCain was running as the Republican uh, candidate for president at the time. And there was a moment at the Republican National Convention where Clint Eastwood got up <laughs> and basically did, I, you already know the moment, yeah. uh, he got up and he basically did a bit of a routine with an empty chair as if he was uh, interviewing Barack Obama. Now, let me say this not as a person who follows politics, but as a comedy junkie, Clint Eastwood should stick to the drama. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the timing, I mean, and, and as a fan of comedy, it could have been done so well. Uh, and it wasn't, again, whether I agreed or disagreed with his premises, the timing wasn't there. The writing wasn't working. And I mean, he had an audience in front of him who could have ate it up if he delivered it well. But again, great dramatic actor, really good director too, but comedy, enough said. So the moment was... The next day, they're interviewing, I forget which station it was on, but suddenly there's a moment, it's some, you know, acting awards show, they're interviewing Jeff Bridges, the dude. They're trying to get the soundbite. Well, what did you think about what Clint Eastwood did last night? Well, you know, I didn't see it, but uh, well, he and I did some movies together in the 80s. I think he's a great guy. And again, they're fighting for the soundbite. So you agree with him. 
well, again, I didn't see it, but I've seen some of the movies he's been doing recently. I love that he's moved into directing. I thought Million Dollar Baby was fantastic. <laughs> so you think he's right. And you see him starting to catch on and go, well, again, I didn't see the bit. So I don't know. And I really can't. And this keeps going for a few moments. And then all of a sudden, the voiceover comes in. Let's head over to this other anchor out in the field. <laughs> they give <laughs> Yeah. The next day, here's why I tell this. The next day, I'm on a radio, I'm on a newspaper interview. They were on the phone and they're interviewing me. And the question was, well, what about the skeptics? It's like, well, you know, I lead with research, educate and inform. And here's a resource like scholar.google.com where we can see all the research around the effectiveness of the techniques in terms of change. Here are the studies in neuroscience that talk about what it is and what parts of the brain are activating the most. Yeah, but what about the people who don't believe in it? <laughs> and I censored out the phrase of, well, if you actually listen to what, of what I just said, right, um, right. I answered with what I really say to people, was it no longer a matter of belief. We've got the science to back it up. We've got the evidence to reinforce it. So I tend to lead with education and it's a matter of who are those people who, and I'm hinting here, who are those people who are actually going to listen to what I have to say? What about the people who don't believe? And I'm now thinking back to Jeff Bridges being interviewed I'm, about this bit. And I just had to eventually say, those people don't call me. Right. Yes, I was pulling my hair out because that's right. The people, stop worrying about the people who don't believe in hypnosis. They're not calling you up to begin with. Now, this brings me to a technique that, if I remember right, it's your handling of something you saw from Melissa Tears that you then modified with permission and made your own of basically turning someone's words into the induction. Yeah. How, again, we don't have to be the wizard. You taught that in that scriptless workshop, which again, right. I'll plug the link again, worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no links. Get four more hours of us teaching a lot of stuff that you are going to use. And in that moment where you don't have to be the expert, you're using their words, their belief systems, their understandings. Let, let me mention another reference here because you brought up finger magnets. This is where I think it's helpful for the practitioner to ask, not necessarily what does this technique do, but instead what does this technique represent? So I've angered a few hypnotists by actually debunking finger magnets. Actually, episode 270 of this podcast, Hypnotic Priming with Convincers. When you do 370 of these, <laughs> 370 of these things, you can just start to reference your own material. Um, next week's impressed. episode will be, let me talk about inductions. Listen to this one, this one, and that one. Let me talk about change. Listen to this one and that one. See you next now. So number 270, Hypnotic Priming with Convincers. I teach in that one a method of doing hypnotic fingers where at the end of it you go, let me explain how that works because I know how to put the right words in the right order and your body knows how to respond. That's exactly what we're about to do with hypnosis. Makes sense? And all of a sudden now they're back on board even further. Right. Because now they're understanding what our role of this process is about to be. And that's a beautiful way of doing that. Here's the thing, Jason. Nobody is a better Jason Lynette than you are. There isn't a better one on the planet. Dan Candelas. And, <laughs> and, and you are the best Jason Lynette that you can ever be, always. So you're putting that out there, but you also know who you are and what you do. You probably don't ever sell yourself as a... Um, Someone who will pick up someone's laundry. I do at home, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, at home. But you're not gonna you're not gonna say that you do that because that's not what you do and not what you would want to do. You know who you are and what you do, right? And when you know who you are and what you do, and you can sell that congruently or you can own that congruently, then and deliver. Make sure that you can deliver. Don't say that you can do something if you can't, but make sure that you can deliver. When you deliver on that, then you've got people who will keep coming back and who will send you more people than you've got referrals. But here's another part of demystifying hypnosis. There's a lot of time and effort spent by hypnotists talking about, oh my God, convincing them, turning, explaining, teaching them, doing all of the things about hypnosis. I wouldn't make, me personally, this is just me in my opinion, I would never make an, a reservation at an expensive restaurant without knowing that I'm going to get a pretty good meal. I would kind of have an idea of what they serve, 
I would kind of have an idea that this is going to be good or it's going to be an experience. And then I will make the reservation at the expensive restaurant. My clients are exactly the same. They're not booking time with an expensive hypnotist, and I'm certainly not the cheapest one in Chicago. They're not booking time with an expensive hypnotist unless they have decided that hypnosis works, that this is going to be a good match to help me make the change I'm going to make, and they're going to already have a level of belief in the process or they wouldn't be in my office in the first place. Nice, nice. I love that as a connection. This is why, again, back to educate and inform, now I'm connecting back when you talked about McDonald's as you talked about a really <laughs> nice restaurant, going into looking at how the restaurant very clearly advertises, very clearly will often invite the restaurant critic in to come eat the food. And then that person then leaves a review online, right? Something for the local paper. So it's where we're always in that mindset of going, what information do people need in order for them to come in. So as we go back to educating and informing, this is where we can just simply start to consider what are all those questions that we often get asked? And those are the videos we ought to put on our websites. Yeah. That's the stuff that we go on to a podcast, perhaps as a guest, and talk about. And by leading with that education, it makes it even easier for them to realize, I'm going to have a fantastic meal of a change. <laughs> Hair and hand hypnotist. <laughs> Let me return it back to demystifying hypnosis and continuing with our, our theme here. Hypnosis happens. It happens all the time. Uh, it, it happens when you're not aware of it. It happens when you're not resisting it. It happens in day-to-day -day life. It happens all the time. Hypnosis just happens. It's sometimes a little harder when you're doing hypnosis on purpose. In other words, when someone comes to you and says, hypnotize me to make a change, that can be, uh, that's, that's an extra step, an extra level of thinking. But hypnosis just happens. It happens all the time. My husband and I have been watching some shows on, on TV the last four or five days. We've got this running thing that we're watching. And uh, while we skip through commercials, we started laughing at this McDonald's commercial that we were seeing about their breakfast items, an apple fritter and a blueberry muffin and a cinnamon roll. And we both, we saw this a couple of times and we commented on it, really? McDonald's is the bakery king? I don't know. We talked about it enough and we saw it enough that two days ago, my husband said, well, what do you think we ought to do for breakfast? And we both said, damn it, let's try the McDonald's bakery stuff. Yeah. He drove over to McDonald's, went through the drive-thru, brought it in, and lo and behold, I've never had a better apple fritter. And I don't even like blueberry muffins, but theirs is damn fine. Nice. Now, I'm a person who hasn't eaten at McDonald's in years. I even alluded earlier to that nasty food because that is in my belief system. But having that constant repetition, because repetition is one thing that works with hypnosis, having that constant repetition, the beautiful pictures, the, oh, you've got to try this, and a little bit of our disbelief that it could possibly be any good, all of that worked to us going and trying their breakfast menu. Nice. All Which, of that's hypnosis, right? Yeah. You heard it, all of the hypnosis in there, right? Well, right there, you just described marketing in terms of staying top of mind. There's a story. And that that's heard, hypnosis. Yeah. There's, there's a reference I heard from Penn Gillette from Penn & Teller, which up until this year, up until 2020, they had their own theater in Vegas. They had a sellout show every single night, five or six nights a week. They were at the top of their career. But as Penn Gillette put it, if we don't, cancel the show if we don't uh, schedule a few days off every now and then to fly to New York City and do a bit on Jimmy Fallon. If we don't schedule three weeks off for me to go do another season, this is going to date the story, back of Celebrity Apprentice, for Teller to direct The Tempest off Broadway. Yeah, that right. If we don't set things off for a bit, for Teller to go off and teach at a college or me to go host a game show on NBC. If we don't turn off what's currently working to go do something else, that's when people start to go, whatever happened to those guys? Right. And I love that for the importance of staying top of mind, continuing to keep that conversation running. You mentioned hypnosis happens. And this is, at least from my former theatrical background, 
the importance of setting the rules of the universe, as in, you know, here are certain TV shows that set a premise and then live through that. There's mm-hmm. certain ways that certain movies set a premise, books. J.K. Rowling created the whole world of Harry Potter before beginning to write. What's his name from? Vince Gilligan says, let's take the dad on the Brady Bunch and slowly turn him into Scarface, and you won't know whether or not he's the villain, and you're still a bit disturbed that you're cheering him on. And that's how he wrote Breaking Bad. Mm. So the through line that I bring to my process with clients, and I, and I express this to them, is basically the idea of, here's how you're already doing this. Let me show you how to do it better. Yes, 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 yes. That's what happens when you listen to your clients and they'll say, I've I've got this or I've got that. Well, have you ever had a time when you had success at something and they start talking about their success? You can find all sorts of strategies in there that you can apply right back to this thing that they're working on now. Yeah. But you got to hear it and listen for it and not assume. I guess that's what I'm saying, Jason, is not assume that you have all of their answers. You haven't walked a day in their life. They have all of their answers. And if you're really good at what you do, you help them bring all of that out and use it. Use it to their own advantage because we're always practicing hypnosis. Just like Henry Ford said, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. So why not think that you can and make that happen? And that's how you kick off a podcast series in 2021. Nicely done. I love that. (laughs) So we'll link over in the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 306. We've dropped a lot of references. Don't put the Clint Eastwood video in the show notes because it's just unwatchable. Everyone can go off and find that for themselves. (laughs) It is on YouTube. But if you head to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no scripts, that's the four hour workshop that Karen and I did together on scriptless hypnosis. You're going to leave that with very specific techniques that you are going to use with your clients. Karen, where can people find you? How can they connect with you online? I made it as difficult as I could. Karen, K-A-R-E-N, at Karen Hand, H-A-N-D, dot com. Karen at Karen Hand, dot com. So is that to say they can also visit Karen Hand, dot com? They can visit Karen Hand, dot com. That's right. Oh, look at that. <laughs> It makes it very easy. And I know you say that we don't have to be the wizard, but what if there were some magic words we could also use? If only (laughs) there was... My book is called Magic Words and Language Patterns (laughs) because what we do feels like magic. We have to know what we're doing. We have to know how to strategically find the leverage. We have to know how to strategically say the words. Jason talked about, he says things in very strategic manners. If we're strategic in what we do, we're going to facilitate those changes lickety split. And we don't have to carry an encyclopedia of answers in our head. All we have to do is facilitate what our clients, the resources our clients already have to make a change. Jason Lynette here once again. And as always, thank you so much for interacting with this program, for using it as a resource in your continued learning and even your conversations. I love how very often in different Facebook groups, people ask a question and they often start to respond by quoting other people who have been on this podcast or even the solo episodes I put out as well. Be sure to check out Karen Hand's book. We'll link to that in the show notes over at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash 306. And once again, check out our on-demand workshop, Scriptless Hypnosis. You can find that at worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash no scripts. That's where you can see a bit of a preview of what you're going to learn in that presentation. And for a very low affordable rate, you can join right away and get instant on-demand access to that. Let me hedge off a common question here. Anytime I do a co-production, that's a separate event. So for those of you inside of Hypnotic Workers, this is a separate program, though it's a low-cost, affordable entry point. And for those of you that are brand new, it's a great introduction to both Karen as well as myself. Either way, in a short amount of time, you're going to learn some strategies that you will use with your clients and possibly even so with yourself. So join us there. It's on demand at your own pace. WorkSmartHypnosis.com forward slash no scripts. See you on the inside. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. 
Hey, it's Jason here, and reading is lame and videos are awesome, so do this right now. Go ahead and click subscribe right here inside of this video, and that will link you to my YouTube channel, and you will be the first to find out as new information is shared here online. Click subscribe now, stay in touch. I look forward to hearing of your success very soon.